OK, so how do you pick up a radio wave coming from space? So how do you emit it? And these are electromagnetic That's waves. Right. So it's an oscillatory field. And what that means, if you have any charged particles, like electrons, and if it's just sitting there, an electromagnetic wave comes past, it'll jiggle it up and down, yep. which gives you an alternating voltage that you can measure. And that's how you receive the things. If you want to emit it, you just get a big wire and you jiggle the electrons up and down by applying an alternating voltage, and that makes the electrons go up and down, up and down, which causes them to radiate electromagnetic waves. Now, this sounds a lot like how an antenna works on your car or home, right, Paul? Well, that, of course, is a radio emitter. Or exactly. so, it's, so, yeah, so basically what we need is a big bit of wire. If you want to transmit things, we connect a volt, alternating voltage across it. And if you want to receive things, we just listen to what voltage comes in. Easy, in, right? That's right. Well, in fact, that's kind of what the early day started. This is Carl Jansky. Now, he was looking for uh, natural objects in space, looking for galaxies and all sorts of things that emitted these radio waves. And this is essentially a giant, fancy antenna. Now, he actually even put it on wheels so he can easily move it around because lugging this giant antenna. But as you said, you could put a current through it if you want to broadcast or send a message into space or try and pick up these waves as they hit it. Yes, I remember when I was an undergraduate going to the Lord's Bridge Radio Observatory outside Cambridge, which is the one that discovered the first pulsars. Yep. And basically it was a sheep paddock <laughs> covered with wires on poles. And originally they would redeploy by having lots of graduate students stand with a pole with wires dangling from them. They'd say, OK, you move a bit to the left, you move a bit to the right, OK. And of course, as the radio waves come in, it'll, electromagnetic waves will cause the uh, electrons in these yes. things to jiggle, which then will give you an alternating voltage, which you can then amplify right. and say, oh, we're getting a radio signal. Exactly. Now, that's great if you want to go look for faraway things in space. But what if you want to look for nearby things, but you need to transmit a lot of data? So this is where we have to look towards the way we build a telescope, essentially. OK. So. Now, this is the Parkes Radio Telescope, again, used for looking at astronomical objects, but it has been used to look at satellites as well. And, and the way this works is, well, it's not too different than any telescope you can actually look at. As you said, this is just light. These are just waves passing through. And telescopes are just kind of big light buckets, right? Yeah, but if you just had an antenna, it'll pick up waves coming from that direction or this direction or this direction. Right. So I mean, if you just have a single rod like this, it's picking up anything around it. it it's blind top and bottom, but anywhere sideways. That's right. And the trouble with that is, let's say you, you're going to be overwhelmed by signals from the wrong sources. You might pick up the signal from your space probe on Mars, but also from your uh, car key fob exactly. across the corner or from the FM radio station nearby. So you really want to focus so you're only paying attention to waves coming from one direction. And that's what essentially these receivers, whether it's a radio telescope or an antenna you put up for listening to your satellite, do. The light comes in from a different source, and we focus that I light. I like mean radio waves. Of radio course, in this waves. Case. Yeah, that's right. And this is important because radio waves are light, right? And this is what yeah. we're talking about. And it works essentially the same way. As you said, then we focus that light, it goes to our uh, receiver, as we call it up here, which is, imagine it's kind of the radio eyeball. Yeah. So up here, it might actually look a lot like a little antenna. Yep. But what you've done by having this whopping great dish underneath is you've collected far more radio waves. Than just this So if you just antenna. had the antenna sitting up there, the radio waves that went there you'd pick up, but the radio waves that went here or here would be missed. But this brings them all in and focuses them. So what's the benefit then of making this bigger? Well, that's going to give you more signal. That's right. And if we want to have more power or download all of those data, all of those images that are huge files, we want a really big dish. Because we just had this little antenna, and you can. You can actually build a little Coke antenna and try and pick up a satellite. Yeah. You're not going to pick up that much data, though. And the problem is with the receiver, you're trying to see the electrons being jiggled when this electromagnetic wave yes. comes in. But the trouble is, the electrons are going to be jiggling anyway because uh, the receiver is not at a temperature of absolute zero. Exactly. I mean, if you look at the electrons in my nose right now, it's at, uh, what, 36 centigrade or whatever it might be, and they are jiggling around just because atoms at a high temperature jiggle around. And so the trouble is that you're trying to pick up the signal from your Mars rover or whatever it might be, superimposed on the signal due to the fact that it's warm. That's right. And so, in fact, you actually get signals that can come from your receiver. Now, this can work purposely, as you said, if we're putting a current to broadcast it, but it happens naturally as well. So while you ha may be emitting energy or radio waves, you're also still trying to pick it up from anything in space. So there's actually a lot of uh, work that then has to be refined in that. Just don't put up a big antenna and start collecting it. 
So when we start looking at these instruments, there's actually a lot more to it in order to get it to work. Yes, yeah, so of course, light waves are reversible. That's um, right. So any system that's good for receiving it can also emit it. You might have to change the instrument at the other end. Uh, but here we've got uh, something that's been transmitting. Yep. Uh, so what you're doing in this case is now down here, you don't have a receiver, you'd have somewhere where you apply the voltage and jiggle the electrons. That's right. And then the waves would come up here, bounce off and be focused out by this great big dish. That's right. And the benefit of having a dish to emit things is again, if I just jiggle my antenna here, it's going to emit in all directions, which means the amount that's going your way is quite small. Most of it's being wasted on the walls over exactly. here or the roof up there. Whereas if I had a big dish behind me, then the signals are mostly go in your direction, which means that you're going to get a much larger fraction of what I put out. And that's what we want, right? If we want to communicate with our craft on Mars or past Pluto, we want as much energy as we possibly can directed at that object in space. Yes, yeah, so it's if you want to send a strong, you have to send a strong signal to overcome this thermal noise. Yep. So you've got the fact that the electrons are jiggling randomly in the receiver on Mars or in the receiver on Earth, and your, your signal has got to be bigger than that so you can see it. And you could either do that by emitting huge amounts of power, which is expensive, or by taking what power you've got and making sure it goes in the right direction. That's right. And usually you have to do both. Yes. You need a lot of power and you need to focus it. So you build really big things and you make them as great as you can. But you obviously don't want to build one just to receive and one just to send. So all of these are configured, as you said, where you can change essentially the back end. Either you can change it to configure it to broadcast signals into space or receive signals from space. Okay, so here we've got the same thing now the other way around. Now the signal's coming in, bouncing up and down to the receiver, and it's the same dish. It's the exact same dish. You just change that instrument on the back end. And this is very important when you're communicating spacecraft. You want to send signals to it and listen. In fact, most of these have multiple modes they can do it into it. And in fact, we're going to go see one at the Canberra Deep Space Network, actually how this all comes into play in practice. <laughs> 